Hello, folks. So welcome uh, to the Berkman Center. Uh, I'm happy to moderate this session where we will be um, discussing the content of and the implications of Hodge and Son's book on uh, technology and public interest. So uh, just a few words at the outset. Um, Quite a long time ago, um, Hao Chen came here for uh, an LLM degree, and um, at the time was working um, with my nudging on this issue, and he's been focused on it um, ever since. It was prescient for him to take up this topic because it has become ever more important uh, in the years since. With a little bit more historical context, uh, debates about the relationship between distributive justice and technological progress have been going on for a very long time. They've been running parallel to an equally venerable debate about um, whether technology or specific manifestations of technological innovations actually for the public good at all. Um, but on the assumption that a particular advancement is uh, net socially beneficial, how to make it as widely available within a given society and globally has been discussed for a long time. It seems to have peaked within the legal system in the mid to late 20th century when there were, as, as Hao Shen indicates in his book, various expressions of the rights of uh, all persons to access this technology. And then it faded into the background a bit. Two aspects of the pandemic have brought it to the fore once again. Uh, the first um, concerns access to information technology when we all came to depend upon online education and uh, it was quickly became apparent that uh, access to the net resources essential to online education, including internet access and computers, was highly unequal, even within the United States. The second of the two aspects of the pandemic that brought this issue back to the fore concerns access to vaccines. When um, we, on the one hand, celebrated the extraordinary breakthrough and speed of the mRNA vaccines, and their capacity to shield us against the horrors of the pandemic, and then acquiesced in a pattern that resulted in um, very slow, still highly unequal distribution of the vaccines globally. When uh, Latin America and even more so Africa had to wait much longer for any access to the vaccines. So right now, People disadvantaged by these especially glaring instances of inequality are pressing for remedies. And most of the time they're pressing for remedies in the form of um, institutional change, like the COVID waiver, for example, currently be discussed in Geneva, which argue its supporters would increase global access. But Haojen is providing a different way of addressing this debate which is rhetorical and legal, trying to re-elevate a um, theory or understanding of the nature of the public interest and its relationship to technology, which is compatible with and arguably could help support the institutional changes, which are the main focus of activists at the time. So it's uh, against that backdrop that it's especially timely for him to come and give us a um, overview of this book and uh, provoke a conversation about it. How oh, Jeff? I have a list. Thank you so much, Professor Fisher. Uh, as Professor Fisher mentioned, uh, I actually started off this project uh, uh, as an LLM student working on a long paper uh, you know, dealing with copyright limitations and the public interest. And Professor Professor Fisher was my supervisor at that time. So it was so great to have him with me right now, uh, introducing uh, the book. So I'm very excited to be back at Berkman's Client Center uh, uh, talking about my book. So um, I'm gonna talk uh, briefly, uh, 
briefly about the, the background information uh, about the book and why uh, I uh, decided to uh, work on uh, this topic. Uh, so uh, Professor Fisher mentioned the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, two core elements uh, that have uh, caused uh, you know, people's concern about uh, technology and the public interest. And uh, the first of all is absolutely the, the inadequate access to the internet for online learning. So I'm gonna supplement with some data. Uh, for example, uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, around 15 million students shifted to online learning. But surprisingly in the United States, one fifth of these students had no reliable access to the internet in their homes. And uh, around the time, at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, research showed that uh, around 42 million people in the US were unable to purchase broadband internet access. And it is also a global problem. Uh, in 2019, nearly half of the world's population had no access to broadband internet. Um, so when you may take the granted that the United States is absolutely the most advanced, uh, most uh, technological advanced country in the world, but still internet access as the pandemic has revealed is one of the, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the most, uh, you know, sort of serious problems uh, in this country. And also the vaccine, I have a little bit you know, more information to our uh, figures to supplement. Uh, for example, as of September 2021, a mere 3% of people in low income countries had been vaccinated. That was in stark contrast with the 60% vaccination rate in high income countries. So it's a question about we have the you know great technology such as mRNA vaccinate a vaccine, but the problem of, is about how to distribute such technological benefits to uh, to more people, right? Not just people in the high income uh, countries. Okay, so when it comes to the normal circumstances, actually, uh, public interest might not still be adequately served. Uh, uh, one of the best example is to take a look at the social media uh, companies. We are dealing with uh, such companies every day, and somehow, uh, you know, there is. Uh, I, I've seen that there has been a severe asymmetry of power and uh, uh, responsibility uh, that such companies should uh, assume. Uh, one textbook example is. Uh, provided by Facebook. So Facebook, as you know, we, we have been using uh, on uh, Facebook a lot, right? Uh, but the problem with this co company is that its data policy has caused serious harm to the public interest. Uh, for example, as you must know, the uh, Cambridge data analytical uh, scandal absolutely is the most serious breach of personal data uh, so far. And uh, Facebook's mishandling of fake news is said to have swayed the outcome of a 2016 U.S. presidential uh, election. And so there, it's no surprising that a UK judge even denounced Facebook as a tool for evil in the judicial ruling. Um, so this has caused a lot of you know, uh, 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 trouble. And also when it comes to take a look at tech companies as Patent holders, you can see a lot of irresponsible uh, actions or decisions. For example, at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, a patent holder actually launched, launched a lawsuit to block uh, coronavirus testing involving the use of its patent. So that was denounced as the most tone deaf IP suit in history. And again, um, um, at the, in, in 2000, when the uh, vaccines have been developed, right? So the World Health Organization encouraged uh, Big Pharma to participate in uh, the uh, technology sharing scheme, such as the COVID-19 technology access pool. But as of March, 2021, 
no pharmaceutical companies had voluntarily joined such a uh, scheme. Worse still, some of them have even condemned it as nonsense and dangerous. So uh, all what has happened has motivated me to work on this book project. So my central question uh, is how we can develop and apply technology in the public interest. Uh, so my approach is to have uh, to have the rights and responsibility combined. So I call it a, a rights and responsibility approach to uh, uh, to deal with this topic. And so the first part is uh, about the protection of rights. So I propose that we should recognize and protect a new right called the right to technology. And first of all, we, we could protect it as a human right under the international human rights uh, system. And secondly, we could further protect it as a collective right in a domestic civil rights law. And I also offered a thought experiment arguing that we could even protect it as a fundamental right under domestic constitutions. So this is the rights part. And the second part of the proposal or approach uh, deals with the so-called fundamental corporate responsibility. I argue that tech companies should uh, uh, be obligated to reciprocate uh, for users' contributions. You should also assume an active role responsibility and also encounter injustices caused by technological development. So in general, I, uh, I want to set the agenda for protecting uh, the public interest in motion first. And then we can, through actions such as lawsuits, we can gain better understanding of the nature and scope of the public interest. This is because the public interest is one of the most elusive concepts. Uh, uh, so and so is technology. So uh, through you know action uh, and motion first. Okay. So let me uh, move on to talk about the uh, human right to technology. Actually, this is not new. Around 70 years ago, international leaders came together to deal with the unprecedented harm caused by the Second World War, especially the military technologies, all kinds of weapons uh, used in the war that caused unprecedented harm to human lives and uh, properties. So they uh, came to the conclusion that technology must be utilized in the public interest. And then they devised uh, a specific clause protecting uh, or promoting such uh, gender. Uh, so Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights states that everyone has the right to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. And uh, at the same time, Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights have a similar uh, mandate. But surprisingly, more uh, uh, this since the adoption of the UDHR, this uh, human right has become a sleeping beauty. Some scholars call it a sleeping beauty. In my book, I call it an orphan in the, in the international human rights system. Uh, no other human right has received such scant attention. And this human right remains obscure, dormant, and totally ineffective. Why is that? So in a book, I revealed that there are three major contributing factors. First of all, this human right is inherent obscure. How do we understand the nature's uh, scope of technology? How do we share the uh, benefits of technology progress, for example? These are obscure concepts. And secondly, as you know, international human rights systems lacks the teeth in enforcing human rights uh, when there is a violation of human rights, uh, it's, it's exceedingly hard to enforce through human rights treaty because it lacks the enforcement, effective enforcement mechanism. But in my opinion, the third factor, the international community's overemphasis on intellectual property uh, is a leading contributing factor. Why is that? Because in the past 70 years or so, the international community has been uh, you know, emphasize on the intellectual property protection and uh, uh, you know, a whole bunch of international IP treaties 
have been concluded. And uh, so the international community was trying to promote distribution uh, of technological benefits through IP protection. Uh, you know, IP protection means voluntary transactions in the marketplace. If you want to enjoy, for example, a patented product, you have to get uh, approval from patent holder or through paying certain kind of loyalties like that. Um, so um, this kind of market-based distribution of technological benefits um, actually has, has eclipsed the human right to technology. So how can we resurrect the human right to technology then? In the book, I argue that we could first protect it as a collective right to technology in domestic civil rights law. So, uh, so before I talk a little bit about collective rights, I want to uh, you know, situate it in the idea of individual rights. Individual rights such as freedom of expression and uh, property and privacy uh, promote personal interests and individuals personal interest. In contrast, collective rights are designed to protect people's interest and in their social membership. Uh, it focuses on how people can become a social member instead of just an individual, right? Um, so this kind of fostering of social membership is key to the idea of collective rights. Um, so there are two kinds of collective rights. First of all, we have uh, societal rights. In my opinion, there are two, kind of, two kinds of collective rights. First of all, societal rights. It's about how we can take advantage of all kinds of resources to uh, better develop a community or a society. So the right to development is a typical <laughs> example about society rights. People, according to this right, people can uh, rely on natural resources to uh, uh, make uh, to develop economy and make a society much better. Okay, group rights is the second category. Uh, they're designed to promote or protect uh, resources such as language, uh, cultural symbols uh, held by a minority uh, group of people. So if we protect uh, technology as a uh, co collective right, first of all, we can protect it as societal rights. So when it comes to uh, you know, technological benefits that are crucial to the uh, development of a society, then it could be recognized as, uh, it could be subject to uh, societal rights to technology. I think uh, internet access, uh, one of the best examples, we rely on the internet heavily to participate in civic dialogue. Uh, um, and uh, a lot of you know, things are occurring on the internet. So it's essential for people to uh, have uh, access to the internet to participate in civic life, uh, politically and culturally. And the group rights to technology are also very important. Um, um, uh, Professor Fisher mentioned uh, uh, pandemics, and uh, I think HIV uh, epidemic is a very important uh, example about how we can rely on the group rights idea. So it, it's basically about identity, right? So if we, for example, if we can recognize, for example, HIV uh, positive people as a certain identity, then they could, uh, this kind of status could entitle them to claim that they uh, should enjoy the benefits of medical research in, uh, in the areas of HIV medicine. And uh, this right can also guard against harmful use of technology, targeting specific people, specific group of people, for example, facial recognition technology have been widely used these days. But some of the facial recognition technology actually automatically recognize, for example, uh, uh, people of color as criminal suspects. So this uh, harmful way of using technology can, uh, can be guarded against by the group rights to technology. So I, as I said, I also offer a thought experiment to see whether the, uh, the right to technology can be further protected as a fundamental right under domestic constitution. So what are fundamental rights? In uh, under U.S. Constitution law, some liberties are so important that they can be regarded as 
fundamental rights uh, that will receive the, uh, the, uh, the, the most uh, you know, uh, rigid form of uh, legal protection. A uh, good example is about, for example, freedom of expression, expression protected by the First Amendment, property protected by the Fifth Amendment. So um, these are enumerated fundamental rights, right? So the U.S. Constitution also allows uh, courts to recognize fundamental rights that are not expressly recognized by the Constitution. These are unenumerated fundamental rights. So what can we do then? So basically, we can rely on the concept of liberty under the 14th Amendment. Courts have recognized unenumerated fundamental rights if they can be defined as liberty under the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution, such as uh, the right to travel, uh, the right to vote, the right to marriage. So uh, my, uh, uh, in my opinion, we can rely on this 14th Amendment conception of liberty to recognize technology as a fundamental right. If we uh, have it recognized as a fundamental right, then it will set a further mandate to require government to the government to provide a, a fair uh, or equal distribution of technological benefits. So technology such as fundamental technology, basically it's about fundamental technology. Technologies that are fundamental to the sustainability of people's lives and freedom, then they should be protected by the fundamental right to technology. So uh, fundamental technologies such as electricity, transportation, telephones, and internet access should be protected. And the government should try their very best to uh, 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 distribute the benefits of these uh, fundamental technologies to every member of uh, this country. Um, but I should have a caveat here. We're not supposed to require the government to distribute uh, some fancy form of the technology not, that are not fundamental technologies. For example, we, we, we should not require the government to let everybody to have, for example, have a ride on Mercedes Benz uh, buses. Uh, we should not require the government to distribute iPhones, latest version of iPhones to every member of this country. So we're talking about fundamental technology instead of, kind of you know, fancy or luxury uh, form of technology. Um, so let me move on to talk about the second part of the proposal. It's about uh, the uh, recognition and enforcement of the fundamental corporate responsibility. So first of all, uh, I argue that we could rely on the ethical norm of reciprocity to require um, tech companies to reciprocate for users' contributions uh, to them. So reciprocity, as I mentioned, is an ethical norm uh, requiring that one should respond to a positive action by another through returning uh, that action uh, proportionally. I think friendship is a very good example. Uh, uh, friendship is normally fostered by the uh, ethical norm of responsibility. When a friend treats you a dinner, or gives you a gift, you, you are supposed to reciprocate by treating him uh, a dinner, but not necessarily dinner, maybe a, a lunch, uh, giving back a gift, or uh, saying something nice on uh, Twitter or Facebook for his or her good deeds, right? Also, oh, that's the, the healthy way of developing a friendship. Uh, so if we rely on the idea of reciprocity, we could see that users' contributions are very important here. First of all, users have contributed a lot of contents to tech companies. We have uploaded a lot of videos, we have posted a lot of information on a variety of uh, uh, internet platforms. And uh, users are also essential to uh, tech companies or social media platforms advertising revenues. Um, this is because uh, uh, you know, companies know that uh, you know, social media platforms can use targeted advertising to reach out to their users. So users are really essential to uh, ad online advertising these days. And also users have uh, been essential to tech companies' innovation because 
A good example is about the data that users has contributed to tech companies. Uh, example, when it comes to artificial intelligence, uh, such as uh, you know, chat GPT, we users actually have contributed a lot of data without you know, you know, users contribute data contribution, then it's they're really impossible to develop uh, you know, artificial intelligence because uh, you know, we, you, we need to use users' data to train algorithms, right? Uh, that are applied uh, in artificial intelligence. And uh, secondly, I also argue that we should require uh, tech companies to assume an active role responsibility. So the idea of role responsibility uh, was first uh, put forward by a British jurist whose name is H.L.A. Hart. So he argued that uh, responsibility should be imposed upon a person based on their specific roles, such as husband, being husband, being a sea captain, being a judge. So if, if as, uh, you know, as a husband, uh, you know, uh, somebody needs to uh, provide support to uh, his family, right? Sea captains are supposed to take good care of uh, their uh, passengers and judges are supposed to make impartial uh, uh, judicial rulings. So if we take a closer look at the tech companies' roles, we can find that they actually uh, play the role of uh, disseminating information. We users upload a lot of information on their platform. They dis disseminate uh, information to the public. So they play the role of being uh, uh, information disseminator. They also collect a lot of information from users, right? Um, so they play the role of information as information collectors. Um, there are also information creators. And um, again, ChatGPT is uh, really a, a, you know, a, 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 the, the, the best example about how tech companies can create information. So given that they play these roles, uh, I argue that they should take care or take takes uh, their roles seriously and then uh, uh, assume an active role responsibility accordingly. Last but not least, I argue that tech companies should also confront injustice, injustice is caused by technological development. Uh, so social justice here, uh, or distributive justice, as Professor Fisher mentioned earlier, is really one of the core uh, human, uh, one of the fundamental values that we chair dearly. Uh, so when it comes to social justice, uh, the conventional ideas that we have, for example, resource-based uh, inequality, unequal distribution of resources lead to uh, resource-based uh, inequality. And also uh, unequal recognition of social status, such as racial uh, discrimination, also cause um, uh, status-based uh, inequality. But in my opinion, we also have the third form of injustice these days. It is called, it should be called technology-driven injustice. Technology are actually causing uh, uh, this kind of third form of injustice. Why is that? So first of all, uh, we have seen a lot of examples about uh, unequal access to technological benefits. Uh, such as in, uh, you know, unequal access to the internet, unequal access to COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so this is, uh, you know, the, the first uh, examples about technology-driven injustice. And also the ways in which technologies are used can also cause this kind of you know, injustice. For example, improper use of technologies can cause serious harms to the environment. Emission of, uh, you know, uh, pollutions have caused uh, serious, uh, you know, uh, uh, degradation to uh, water resources, uh, you know, air, for example. So, um, so in the last chapter of my book, I talked about how we can deal with, uh, you know, such kind of you know, uh, 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 fundamental corporate responsibilities. I use uh, patent holders, tech companies and patent holders, as example, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to enforce this idea. So if you're interested, you can uh, read the last chapter of the book. And uh, so this is pretty much like what, what I wish to share about the book. And uh, I look forward to uh, comments uh, from the panelists and from the audience.
Thank you so much. Okay, two comments. So, uh, Professor, this is an excellent uh, argument, actually. In the introduction, uh, all, the, all the clarity, and uh, it's written very well. If you actually buy the book, I encourage you. And uh, one of the critique, critique to, uh, to promote the discussion with the uh, engagement from the audience is that uh, we have a very different situation in the US in the COVID uh, situation too. Of course, the access was the problem of the internet. Uh, but again, the more access and more conversation sometimes actually create more problem. Uh, that was the case of the COVID misinformation. And uh, I think that the solution, some of it, of course, actually makes sense for the global South context. But the, in the US situation, we have a very different situation. I think that it's the same as South Korea too. They have a lot of access. But that doesn't mean that they have a better knowledge of the use and then access sometimes create more problems. So how we actually uh, reconcile uh, different demand uh, among different tiers of a nation? Oh, sure. I, I can learn. I like doing it. Sure. Great. Um, so first of all, I want to say this is a really important and, and timely book. So it's, it's, it's great to have an opportunity to have a conversation uh, about it, you know, post COVID, but also a lot of the, the key challenges that we're facing today when it comes to um, large scale platforms, the development and deployment of AI systems. Um, and one of the real reasons why I, I, I like this framework is because it, it offers a, a kind of um, alternative uh, framework, regulatory, ethical governance framework than the, the public health framework that we often see, you know, sort of discussed in relation to platforms. And I'll, I'll come back to that uh, in, in a moment. So I have a, a comment and two questions um, about the book. So. Um, one is, I think, you know, one of the, the, the real nice um, values and contributions of the book um, is some of the history that you discuss right in Article 27, right? You look at the right of technology under, you know, international human rights law, and you're quite right, you're quite right that, you know, that, that right of everyone to share in scientific advancement and benefits um, has laid dormant, and I think you, you breathe life into that history, and I think that's uh, and important to understanding current debates for sure. Um, I thought I'd suggest an additional bit of history from the same uh, period that's been somewhat less dormant. And the way that I, you know, that that I came to engage with it was, um, you know, ten years ago, uh, this UN Special uh, Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Frank Larue. Yeah. Uh, in his report in 2011, recognized a right to the internet, got a lot of attention. And shortly thereafter, I you know, I wrote sort of a brief history and intellectual origins on this right. And as part of that history, I sort of looked at um, the right to communicate, which got a lot of momentum in the 1980s, um, but also even the intellectual origins behind that and LaRue's report in the right to internet access um, is you know, this post-war context that you write about in the book, in addition to this interesting scientific right under Article 27, you had the, in the post-war period, the free flow of information paradigm, right? Where during the war, you had propaganda and radio jamming at scale by states. And so the, the solution to that in the post-war period was, well, we need information to flow across borders. And technology was key to that access to shortwave long-range radio technology um, was sort of a, the long-term solution to ending um, propaganda, which could lead to war, right? Um, and so I think there's a really interesting history there because you look at uh, the right to communicate, which got momentum within UNESCO in the 1980s, um, internet access, and some of the history speaks to access to technologies. Right. And I think part of how it lost uh, momentum in the 80s, it got tied up into sort of contrary movements within the international community around censorship and radio jamming. 
Um, and so then lots of support of the West. But I think that's another sort of historical angle that justifies exactly what you're, you're arguing, at least internationally. Um, two other sort of quick uh, uh, comments and then questions. Um, secondly, and for those who were here earlier for Biela Coleman's presentation, she talked about the politics of technology. So I'm thinking um, Langdon Winter's famous piece, um, you know, do technology, do, do artifacts have, have a politics? And he argued that, you know, the famous example he gave is that, you know, the, the bridges on Long Island were built low um, intentionally to, so that public um, transport to the beaches on Long Island um, you know, wouldn't be as accessible to sort of marginalized communities like African Americans or um, uh, lower class working class families that would be using public transit. They're too low, the buses couldn't pass through. And so maybe one question that I would pose to your work, how do you respond to, because you're quite sensitive to the politics of public interest. Um, how do you respond to the politics of technology and to use the COVID example? Um, and and I and I'm young also mentioned this in his comments, is how you know during the pandemic, you know, Zoom provided um enabled great opportunity for connection and communication during um lockdowns, but also we're seeing in retrospect how education done remotely and the educational outcomes and learning outcomes have been dreadful done remotely and disproportionately it's been marginal communities that have been disproportionately affected. So that technology, remote technology, video conferencing enables certain social outcomes, but it also precludes social outcomes as well. So that's sort of one question. And, and, the, and the last um, question, and I, I'd love to hear more about this. I know in your final chapter, you talk about um, patents, but I'd love to understand a little bit more about how you think your framework works in response to in relation to some of the new governance proposals that we're seeing in the US and around the world um, around social media platforms, for example. So in Europe, you have the Digital Services Act, um, the conversation in the US, including, um, you know, leading BKC um, folks like information, Jonathan Zittrain talking about information fiduciaries, imposing responsibilities, on platforms, technology companies. And of course, lastly, my home country, Canada, thinking about imposing on platforms a duty of care. And often the justification for those frameworks are a public health framework that technology has health and harm implications. So therefore we should justify these new regulatory frameworks on the basis of public health conceptualizations. But I think what's interesting about your proposal is that it provides sort of a rights base framework for those same proposals. Um, but maybe I'm I'm taking it too far. How, so my question is, how do you view your framework in relation to some of those new regulatory proposals? Because I think it I think it's interesting because it it, it provides an alternative to public health in this way. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jan and John. These are great comments. I, I learned so much. And uh, so I'll quickly respond to Yang's uh, concern about having uh, too much access to technology or too much enjoyment of technology. Uh, I think this is indeed a concern these days because, uh, for example, smartphones have become our bedfellows or lovers, even uh, you know, so they're more, they could be more important than our beloved uh, ones. And so, uh, and, uh, um, um, you know, so, uh, so I think uh, well, uh, technology is, so this is, uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, the, the other aspect of technology. Well, technology can do uh, good things to us. At the same time, technology can also do bad things. For example, we, I talked about the example of the Second World War, where uh, uh, military technologies uh, caused the unprecedented harm to uh, 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 our, you know, uh, to our globe, uh, to our world, and so I think uh, you know. So the to deal with the uh, harmful effects of technology or egregious, even egregious effects, is absolutely part of this book project because the right to technology or the human right to technology, as I mentioned, is to 
prevent um, the technology to be used harmful to the public interest of humanity. Um, so that's the idea. And uh, so it, we, uh, we can rely on this idea to deal with uh, the harmful effects of technology. And um, uh, so for example, I think a group right to technology is a very good uh, example about how we can uh, so, you know, rely on this idea to promote uh, so, you know, uh, you know, uh, harmful user technology to a certain, uh, uh, for example, group of people by, by their race. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, children could be seen as a special group, how we can prevent technology uh, from being used, uh, you know, harmful to children's interest. Uh, for example, their obsession with uh, social media. Um, so these, I think these, uh, if we have uh, such rights, we could, uh, you know, prioritize these agendas uh, because these are the rights that, you know, uh, that deserve urgent attention and legal protection. Um, so uh, uh, with re respect to uh, John's uh, first uh, uh, comment on uh, the, uh, so your first comment is concerned with, uh, sorry, I'm, I should talk quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, so the, the that additional um, history behind like the right to communicate, which with, and the right to internet access recognizing the web and the right to communicate, which got some momentum in the 1980s within UNESCO mm -hmm. and sort of built into that um, right. It was based on the ICCPR right to see yeah, yeah, yeah. and impart information. The one conceptualization that got some momentum was a positive right that states would have to provide access to communication technology. So it's an additional history that I think provides, informs, but also provides additional foundation for your argument yeah. internationally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So th this is really relevant. I actually cited Lalou's uh, report in my, uh, uh, in my book. And uh, 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 so, uh, you know, access to the internet, uh, according to that uh, report, uh, relies on uh, the human right uh, to freedom of expression instead to uh, instead of uh, the right to technology. So this is a sort of you know, an interesting element to show that uh, how this human right has been so, you know, uh, has been a forgotten right. Mm -hmm. um, um, so with respect to your uh, uh, questions, uh, I think the the the, the the other regulatory approaches are also really important. And uh, so, uh, for example, I talked with uh, Professor John Falcon, mm -hmm. Jeff Falcon yesterday about the information fiduciary approach. And uh, uh, so I totally, uh, you know, agree that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, these uh, theoretically and policy uh, oriented approaches are really important. Uh, but one of the uh, one of my concerns with the information fiduciary approach is that it, it is a little bit narrow minded. It only deals with uh, tech companies' responsibilities, uh, um, dealing with uh, collector collection of personal data. But actually, tech companies are doing much more than uh, collection of personal data. I mentioned that they also play the role of disseminating information. They also uh, create information, they also moderate content, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in, uh, uh, I, in my book, I uh, show that uh, you know, the rights and the responsibility approach actually offers a, a, a more, uh, it's, it's kind of a broader approach to deal with a whole range of issues that uh, or problems that uh, uh, tech companies have caused. And uh, um, so um, uh, I, I, I think, uh, so the, the approach that I propose in the book shares some commonality with the uh, regulatory approaches such as the information fiduciary approach. But in general, it's uh, so you know it takes the you know information fiduciary you know approach to deal with you know several other important areas as well. So it says I intend I intended to broaden the information fiduciary approach. So. That's that's really interesting, um, and 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 just so I I, I understand you, um, so then, if from your view and from your framework, 
information fiduciaries is sort of a too narrow framework. I think that's really interesting. Uh, so then maybe your approach, um, would you say then is, uh, is more likely to justify, for example, the approach by the EU under the Digital Services Act, which imposes an obligation on companies to manage their systemic risk. Um, and that can include a range of different yeah. contexts, not just data collection, content moderation, recommender systems, all of that. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. With respect to uh, your another question about how we should uh, uh, better distribute ben uh, technology benefits to uh, a range of uh, uh, disadvantaged groups, uh, I think uh, uh, the the rights and uh, responsibility approach also has this kind of uh, edge. Uh, so, for example, the information future approach, so you know. Uh, it's more or less, as I said, it's more or less de dealing with, uh, you know, collection of uh, personal data, right? So in my opinion, -ish, we should also uh, deal with, uh, you know, uh, 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 broader projects. For example, uh, Professor Fisher mentioned distrib distributive justice. Um, and uh, so I think the whole uh, the, the whole landscape we're seeing is that tech companies are trying to dominate our daily lives. But the problem is that we, uh, we, we, we still uh, lack the legal uh, tools or uh, legal doctrines or regulatory uh, mechanism to uh, counter their uh, you know, uh, uh, dominance. Um, so what shall we do then? Uh, so I think uh, the the right to technology as well as the fundamental corporate responsibility can uh, shed light on how we could uh, you know sort of come together to uh, reveal uh, a lot of you know problems such 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 as for example harm cost to uh, specific groups of people and society at large. So we need to give people the uh, legal tools to protect their interests. Uh, for example, if we rely on the uh, recognition of the collective right to technology, then we can empower citizens to uh, uh, sue uh, the government or tech companies if uh, their collective right to technology is not ad adequately protected. And if we have legal actions like that, we can start talking about not only technological benefits, but also uh, the nature and scope of the public interest. So, and not to sort of have the issues hide in black box, especially the, for example, algorithm developed and utilized by tech companies as black boxes. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I think at this point, we should engage the audience some more. So, um, Zia, we started a little late. So can you give me a sense of when we can go to? Yeah, so we can take three questions from the audience, and then we have a couple from the virtual that we'll just hand off uh, and get around off the show. Okay, Thank great. You. Do you have a microphone you can pass around, or you want to take mine? Yeah. I'll take yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I just want to ask on your comment on distributed justice and uh, 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 the question that we have to better distribute tech to the disadvantage. Uh, I'm glad you started with uh, examples of uh, COVID-19 and uh, uh, HIV AIDS. Um, my father died of COVID. Uh, that's fine. But I, I want to give an example, you know, the way he died is uh, because uh, the government was instructed by the West to push everyone into quarantine. And uh, yes, so schools closed and schools like, you know, there we don't use technology like here, like Zoom. So there was no school for about six months. And uh, my dad who lived alone, you know, now had to accommodate about 20 people in the house. You know, so that was one of the ways in which he actually ended up getting COVID. Then the second thing is within the communities, uh, there were people that were coming up with ideas, say, oh, I think this can work. And the governments were instructed not to actually 
follow those ideas, but wait on the West, uh, the Western world to actually create a vaccine to actually help those people. So the people are living without a solution because the West dictated that, you know. So, uh, and it's the same with HIV. I know some people would say, oh, those people are not qualified, but the question is who decides who is qualified? I know for a doctor, a scientist who actually came up with what he called a vaccine or a cure for AIDS, and he was highly scrutinized. He still uses it. The government of Zambia, where I'm from, actually tried it and they said, well, it's safe, you can use it, but it's useless. That was the point, you know. So the question that comes is, like when we talk about, you know, uh, the fundamental right to technology, whose technology are we talking about? To what extent can you guys actually say, I'm not feeling well, I'll go to Zambia and use their medicine, you know? Or to what extent are you going to say, I'll go maybe to the global south and have surgery, you know? So I think those are some of the things, saying a fundamental right to technology using an African phrase is a pregnant point. You know, we need to define what we mean by technology. You know, do we really mean an inclusive technology? Are we open to actually, you know, accommodating other thinking or somebody has to decide what I need to have? Thank you. Should I respond to that question? Uh, okay, great. Thank you so much. First of all, I'm very sorry for your loss. And uh, uh, and uh, so uh, what you said absolutely reminds me of uh, a paper that uh, Professor uh, Fisher published on the local production of uh, vaccines uh, in low-income countries. So I think this is very important to promote uh, local capacity. And uh, uh, so thank you, Terry, uh, for this great project. And uh, uh, so what, it, uh, what you remind, uh, what you uh, told, shared with us reminds me of the very important dimension of the public interest. So uh, when it comes to the public interest, we normally just think in the context of national uh, considerations. Uh, we, we, we protect the public interest, for example, just within the United States, for example. So this, in my opinion, this is a narrow-minded understanding of the public interest. The public interest also has a global dimension. Uh, the, this, uh, this pandemic has prove, uh, proven that uh, if we only have a, so, you know, a national conception of the public interest, it's going to be really uh, uh, not... Uh, feasible or not, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, not workable. Uh, the, the pandemic has proven that because, uh, you know, a coronavirus can sp spread around uh, the globe, right? Okay. And uh, so the idea of right to technology actually promotes this kind of global vision of the public interest, because we need to think about uh, how we could, for example, uh, define, uh, you know, the public interest in, for example, at a society large to a certain, uh, you know, uh, group of people within one country or in another country, and also fundamental right, uh, you know, that basically cares about every individual's personal needs. Um, so it, it does have a global dimension. I think we should take one more question from the audience. Yeah, from the, take online. One from, um, the online audience and then wrap it up from there. But one person asked, and I think this really helps tie up the conversation, that in a global world with borderless technology, how can we actually partake in a borderless united dialogue and effort when it comes to unifying us with this concept of the public interest? And as we move forward with making sure that technology is accessible to all, what's that look like? Again, when we live in a world where we're borderless in many ways, and we have very different backgrounds too, how do we take that into account? Um, so this comment actually is uh, absolutely related to uh, what this gentleman shared earlier, um, and uh, and also uh, the pandemic has proven that we absolutely need to have a global vision and uh, think beyond borders. Uh, so uh, so. The, the human right to technology, as I 
uh, mentioned earlier, absolutely, you know, international leaders 70 years ago uh, actually thought beyond borders by uh, protecting this human right, right? This human right is regarded as a universal right, right? It's in, embodied in universal declaration of human rights. So at the very beginning, uh, this human right has a borderless, you know, kind of, you know, uh, 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 a mandate. Uh, but, but then the problem is that uh, when it comes to uh, intellectual property protection, it's actually protected domestically. I mean, if intellectual property protection has uh, 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 boundaries. Uh, so that's another kind of, you know, uh, kind of a way of thinking about it. Okay, the con so the con the potential conflict between uh, the protection of human rights to technology and uh, you know globally and uh, protection of intellectual property rights uh, within a specific country and this could cause uh, some you know, a conflict of interest and it's a matter of how we should deal with it and uh, I I think the last chapter of the book sheds light on this discourse, uh, we should think, we could think about rights. At the same time, we should also think about tech companies' responsibilities. Uh, so when it, when it comes to uh, responsibilities, uh, you know, the, the, their rights are protected, not only in the United States, but also other countries as well. So as an intellectual property owner who, for example, who live in the United States, their rights are also protected elsewhere in the world, right? Okay, although there are uh, boundaries, right? Okay, so their the responsibility attached to their intellectual property rights not only should be enforced here in the United States, but also uh, enforced in other countries as well. So if we think through, uh, you know, this kind of rights and uh, responsibilities approach, we could have a much broader vision of how we should deal with uh, the, uh, you know, a whole range of uh, global matters. I want to say just two things in closing. The first is uh, following this lead. Uh, Hao Chen and his colleague Madhavi Sunder have contributed to a course, an online course that Ruth Okadaji and I put together on um, intellectual property and global public health. It's now in its 10th of 12 weeks. And it most of the participants are from um, low and middle income countries. They were intentionally selected. So there are 500 people from 90 countries now. And, and uh, it is a global conversation about these issues. Uh, with respect to this gentleman from Zambia's question, you, you might, all the materials are open to the public. You might find it useful a recorded interview I did a week ago with uh, Martin Fried, who is the head of vaccine research at the World Health Organization. He um, comes from Namibia, he was educa educated in Cape Town. He's now the head of vaccine research in Geneva. He's very interested in the issues that you identify and reflects upon them in this interview, which is accessible through the website for this course. It's not simple, the answer, that's for sure, but you know, that's one source of information. Here's the second comment. Um, I would urge Hao Chen, as you deploy this book into the world, to uh, not to put too much weight on formal adoption of the right sufficiently um, vigorous to support a suit, lawsuits against the companies. I think that's unlikely to happen, at least in the United States, and the EU is a little bit different the climate. But um, what mo I think more generative, very helpfully generative about your book is altering the rhetoric, the way in which we think and talk about these things, which can support a wide variety of initiatives to um, augment distributive justice vis-a-vis -vis technology. Thank you, everyone, for coming and for uh, participating in an enlivening conversation.